Coming up on this week in computer hardware, Dell's new XPS 13 9370. We got benchmarks. Apple's new educational iPads got a pencil. Intel's VR ready Super Nook for gamers. We got benchmarks on that too. Crucial's SSD bargain. Microsoft's Denali and some stupid fast memory. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This. Is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 459, recorded March 29th, 2018. New Dell XPS 13 and a VR ready nook. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch's weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most engaging, most informative, most delightful, most occasionally frustrating, usually about GPUs in the last year, news and reviews of PC and mobile hardware. And uh, joining us today, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Alan Malventano, PC Per's storage maven, and who's here in place for Mr. Ryan Shrout, who is trapped in an airport fuming at last report. Probably. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's probably what he's doing. Alan does not like, suffer flight delays. I feel well. like I was here. Oh no no no! I wasn't. I was in not California. <laughs> I, I I went to California. Uh, la was it last week? Yeah, mm -hmm. last week. Uh, got back just in time for us to record our weekly podcast. But uh, I had the worst head cold of my life on on the flights back. Um, yeah, elevation changes and pressure changes in airplanes while you have like a crazy sinus thing. No. No, do not recommend. I've been known to pound Sudafed. If I have even the suggestion of a cold, I will pound Sudafed 30 minutes before a flight uh, and then uh, immediately request hot tea so I can hoover the vapors up in an attempt to keep my skull from splitting open at altitude. Um, yeah, that's a fun thought. Apple educational announcement took place this week in Chicago. Radical change from uh, their usual venues for debuting new products um depending on how you feel about the announcement it was either delightful or huh um 299 for the new ipad with pencil support and the big thing about that is it essentially delivers the ipad pro pencil support in an inexpensive laptop i myself am curious about logitech's crayon um one of the accessories coming out with that but it's essentially it's a 9.7 inch ipad uh with really really familiar specs with a slightly reduced price and the ability to use a pencil. Um, you know, touch IDs in there, AC FaceTime camera, 10 hours of battery life, uh, an 8 megapixel rear camera, LTE is an option, um, reasonably powerful A10 fusion chip. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm curious. The, the rumor was that it was going to be like a $260 iPad, um, not... Uh, the iPad with the pencil and the keyboard, if you get all the optional accessories, is something like $450. Uh, a lot of the talk online this week was looking at the market penetration on Chromebooks versus uh, pretty much everything else uh, being sold to education. Uh, and some, you know, if you search for, you know, iPad education Chromebook and just turn it loose on Twitter, for example, you'll see a, uh, a lot of actual well, well reasoned arguments about why uh, everything is awesome with Chrome, or I should say Chromebooks versus everything sucks with Chromebooks. Um, and a lot of conversation about what the downside of getting locked into the Apple ecosystem might be uh, for or for educational uh, investors. So, um, you know, something like 60% of the, you know, computers being sent into classrooms today or purchased in classrooms today are Chromebooks, uh, mostly because they are so much better uh, to manage and, you know, well, not you know, nearly as open as, say, Linux, um, the tools are available and it's much less constrained or much less likely to be dropped on a whim than than the Apple products. Um, and it's crazy. Uh, one of the things I note in this Verge article we linked to before was that uh, iPads and Mac laptops something, had something like half of all mobile devices shipped to schools in 2013. Um, and now Apple is behind Google and Microsoft in terms of educational uh, sales. So, 
I, I'm curious. On one hand, I think it's great to see that Apple is starting to pay attention to things other than uh, iOS devices. Um, I'm a little concerned if it's too little, too late, uh, and uh, I'll be very, very curious to see who picks this up and and where it ends up. So, any any exciting thoughts about uh, iPads and educational markets, or should we I, just uh, move? I, sh- I share your story? I share your sentiment. <laughs> I share your sentiment. I think for it to catch on better, it, it should have been like in that mid two hundred price point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's not inexpensive. Um, they also, I mean, you know, managing managing electronics with any school or school district uh, is is problematic. Uh, and the more expensive they are, and the easier they are to break, the more problematic it gets. I would be very curious to see what stats look like for schools with iPads in terms of the survival rate of screens. But I also break screens better and faster than most people, so that may be a problem I have. Dell XPS 139370, this is the... Evolutionary leap, as Ken writes uh, in the title on PCPro.com, the full review up on that. Um, you know, th- this is so, you know the the new laptop came out in 2015. The quad core processors, I got to look at one of those. Reviewed the uh, 23 or 9360, I want to say, uh, back in fall of 2017. Um, yep. Yeah, the quad cores came is, out then, and then this this model also shares the same CPUs. Probably um, the biggest and most important change is underneath the Dell logo, underneath the monitor, is the centered but still nose cami uh, webcam on that one. Um, sorry, you were starting right, to but say, it is a, but it is a Windows Hello enabled camera this time. I want to be in love with Windows Hello. I I've been using it on a Dell XPS twenty seven all in one, and it does yep. work. Uh, I find that I have to move my face a lot to get it to show up based on the location of the webcam, or it's just more finicky than I think it should be. Um, right. This is pretty crazy, right? This is like they've dropped it down from 0.6 inches to 0.46 inches at its thickest point, which is like a 23% reduction in thickness. Um, we talked about it when they announced it uh before CES at the tail end of 2017, like some pretty amazing material science and engineering went into this, like aerogel impregnated Gore-Tex cloth to distribute uh, the heat, so you're you know you don't fry yourself on the keyboard. All USB-C ports, uh, which is either a positive or a negative depending on who you are. Um, it does come with I'm an s- adapter. It comes with a single uh, C to A USB adapter because they. They feel your pain, right? If you try to ship somebody a laptop with no USB-A ports on it, uh, mm-hmm. you need some way to plug in like your your thumb drive that is probably still a Type A right. at this point. Um, specs aren't bad. There's a thousand dollar entry level model with only four gigabytes that I would suggest you avoid because Windows, um, the eight gigabyte eleven ninety nine model is uh, two hundred fifty six gigabytes of PCI Express storage. Um, or excuse me, eight gigabytes of memory, two hundred fifty six gigs uh, of storage, and a Core i five. Uh, 8250U, bumping up to 1399 gets you a Core i7 8550U, and then jumping up to $1,899 gets you the epic 3840 by 2160 Infinity Edge touch display um, versus the standard uh, 1920 by 1080 Infinity Edge display that is not touch and is lower resolution on the $1,000, $1,200, and $1,400 models. Um, You also get, along with that Infinity Edge uh, touch display, you get 16 gigs of RAM, a half half a terabyte of storage in that Core i7-8550U. How are you feeling about the transition to sort of like, you know, Thunderbolt USB-C ports? I'm okay with it. Um, Mm -hmm. it, Somebody has to push either, you know, a push or a pull, right? Either, you, you know, if you, the sooner you get the devices with nothing but Type-C ports on them, then the sooner you'll start seeing people start shipping products that are just meant to connect to Type-C. Just, it's a chicken and egg problem, and somebody has to take the leap, you know, in in order to, to just kind of push the technology along. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. There's, just nothing, there's nothing, there's no real downsides to having the port, right? It's generally a good thing. You just have this port on your laptop that you don't need a dedicated charge port anymore. You just right. use one of your Type C ports to charge, right? Um, right? Or you use them for data, or you plug a hub in that you can pass your power through, and also have you know data devices connected. So, yeah, it's very flexible. Uh, we just kind of need more of it, and we need everything else to start using it, right? Right. 
Um, in terms of performance, uh, pretty similar. Uh, pretty similar to the ninety three sixty, the the quad core uh, upgrade that went in place at the tail end of the XPS thirteen ten year. Um, you know, it's nice that it's 4K. I love that you can actually put a standard M.2 SSD in there to upgrade it. The RAM is soldered on the motherboard, just to remind everybody. Um, you know, they're very, very proud of the rose gold slash white model in no small part because of the woven glass uh, wrist rest. Um, and uh, Dell, like when we went and saw these early models, they were very adamant about telling people that a, a large part of the reason for going to this particular uh, material was that it should not uh, yellow in sunlight, which uh, is a big deal. Rose gold, of course, always a fabulous option. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a nice looking laptop. I personally yeah. tend to go, you know, more for darker or just black or gray. Uh, well, we're a little machines, filthy, but <laughs> well, you know, but it, but it looks it looks very attractive. I've seen it in person. Yeah, it's a nice sharp looking machine. Something that I was pretty impressed by uh, was looking at. Uh, the XPS 13, 19, or 9370 versus the 9360, um, Cinemage R15, the uh, multi-core, a little bit of, pretty kind of healthy, I want to say not quite 20%, you know, maybe 15, 18% performance improvement in that, which I assume is is uh, is uh, dealing with uh, uh, improved thermals because they doubled the number of fans inside of this unit. Uh, to increase airflow over the processor. And in my personal experience, having looked at um, a number of uh, quad-core units with uh, uh, in everything from a Microsoft Surface Pad through the Dell XPS 13 and then looking at the evolved uh, you know, next-gen Dell XPS 13 uh, performance numbers here, is airflow over these U processors is critical for having any kind of rendering or serious, like if you're you know, compiling uh, programs or something like that. Because it's amazing to look at the service, uh, the, the service book I looked at which you know doesn't have a fan, right? It's passively cooled. It was atrocious to watch the processor get heat sunk or heat saturated, and the performance of the processor, you know, it would just scale the speed down slower and slower and slower to prevent uh, the processor from you know shutting down from being thermally saturated. But um, it's uh, it's pretty impressive. I didn't expect to see that kind of performance boost. Uh, in the processor on the next generation, so that's pretty exciting to look at. Battery life, what did uh, what did Ken find with battery life? Pretty similar to the ninety three sixty. Yeah, it ended up falling just like just a tad behind it, but um, mm -hmm. you know there was a different configuration in this system compared to when we tested the ninety three sixty. So, right, you know the, the the expectation is that the battery life would be equal or better. Um, so we're probably just in you know slight variances due to configuration right. and just run to run variants there. Um, but you know, good eight hours, uh, of use. Um, and we're, we're a little bit of aggressive on how bright we put the display on our test. So, sure. you know, if you're, if you're, if you tailor your display to a, uh, you know, a, if you don't have your display on the bright side and B, if you opt for the 1080 display as opposed to the 4k display, which was what was in this model, uh, mm -hmm. you're going to do much better even than eight hours. Um, nice. unless you're doing, unless you're doing something crazy, that's just, you know, pegging the CPU or the GPU. Um, but yeah, just regular, typical kind of use, you know, productivity stuff. Um, pretty much an all-day battery. Right. Interesting, interesting. So those are available now. Um, Ken says, uh, you know, the, the, the high-end configuration with the the 4K touchscreen is, is a little staggering. Uh, you're looking at uh, $1,900 for that. Uh, he thinks he would go with the 1080p version with a i5 8250U, 8 gigs of RAM, and a 256 gigabyte SSD, which ends up being about $1,200. Um, 8 gigabytes is not bad uh, if you're not video editing or doing some serious uh, application run, and 8 gigabytes should be more than enough to sustain you. Uh, really, yeah, and even, really impressive and even if you and even if you occasionally dabble into, you know, having things that are actually using more than 8 gigs, there's a decent mm -hmm. SSD in there. You know, it, 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 it can page out to the SSD if it really right. needs to, and it'll still be decent. It won't be completely dog slow. Um, you know, unless you're really just doing crazy power user stuff that is actively using, you know, greater than 8 gig worth of RAM. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, and that's a decent, that price point of all those specs you just rattled off, pretty decent machine overall is 1200 bucks. So, yeah. uh, you know, 
it's great, great for that price for what it is for the size battery you get, how long it lasts, and uh, you, you know just the sharp look of it overall. Um, can give it editor's choice. I, I agree with it. It's a nice looking machine. Yeah. No, yeah. I've I was I've been carrying Dell XPS 13s as my primary laptop for several years now, and and they hold up extraordinarily well. So way to go, Dell. Yeah, keep it. I, I recently I recently went a different route, and I was so remember that Yoga OLED I reviewed. Mm -hmm. About a year ago with the OLED screen that I was just impressed like crazy with. I ended up buying the second generation of it, like not even, you know, trying to ask Lenovo or for a long term review or whatever. I was so impressed with it. I just forked my own cash down, just bought myself (laughs) one. Uh, And I got the I got the non OLED version for my wife because she needed the the battery to last longer because she's trying to use it for college. Um, And OLED takes, you know, consumes more power than the the standard display. Uh, Funny story there. You know how the those those keys retract into the body on the second generation mm-hmm. yogas, right? Uh, and yeah. they do that so when you flip it over in tablet mode, you're not actually pushing keys with, you know, if it's up on the table or whatever. And and it also withdraws the keys into the body so that the screen can sit flat without the keys kind of mashing up against the screen. So it's pretty cool design. But mm-hmm. uh, she had hers, there was a defect with her keyboard, her right arrow key stopped working after a couple months. And we're like, Okay, oh, wow. we'll bring it into service, and it's under warranty, and they'll, you know, they'll do it. And we have a micro center nearby, and it's a, you know, a Lenovo uh, warranty repair center. Also, uh, we bring it in there. The replacement for the keyboard on the second generation Yogas uh, and ThinkPads and any of those other devices that have the keys that retract into the body. Right. Uh, the keyboard is one assembly with the top frame of the machine. Oh. So the keyboard, if you order a replacement keyboard for one of those, you're getting the shell of the laptop <laughs> as a replacement part, which means that in order to replace said keyboard, you are removing every component that attaches to the body of the laptop. You're basically ter- doing an iFixit teardown on your laptop, mm. and then you're moving all those parts into the other top shell piece. Um, and the poor guys at Micro Center, it was the first time they had done it, and when they finished and I went to go pick up the laptop, the keys were not retracting into the body. And I was like, I hate to tell you this, guys. You, you missed a part. Something, something didn't get lined up. And the poor guy had to completely tear down the whole thing all over again and figure out what was making the keys not retract. So, um, Oh, goodness. If you're the kind of person that spills things into your laptop uh, or might be prone to do that, uh, definitely get the better warranty. Or maybe don't go for that particular kind of uh, keyboard style. <laughs> because it's it's not a five or ten dollar part on eBay, buddy. Uh, oh. You're just gonna get the replacement keyboard. <laughs> it's just it's crazy. That's an expensive. Uh, it's an expensive and emotionally traumatic repair. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Noctua's NHLN. Excuse me. NH dash L. 9A dash AM4 CPU cooler review. Uh, I was delighted by this because I have the previous generation uh, knocked to a cooler, and uh, I was very curious to see Maury's review on this up on PC Per. In part because I have another Mini ITX super low profile case build coming up, and this time I'm putting a, an AMD uh, Ryzen 1700 inside of that. So well, this, uh, is, this is your this is your heatsink for you. Virtually you know. silent, practically noiseless. Uh, does yep. great at stock CPU speeds, but as one might suspect from such a small, compact, yeah, tiny uh, cooler, this is not something you want to use for overclocking. Um, right. It can know. only do so much, right? There's only so yeah. much surface area there, and the fan is only so large, and you're mm-hmm. you're definitely taking a, a hit on and as a compromise there on yeah. how much heat you can dump into this thing. But if you're not going crazy with your with your build or your heat output or your of your mm-hmm. CPU. This will do just fine. It'll run reasonably quiet, and it you know right. it'll it'll it won't. It's not going to let your CPU get so hot that you start thermal throttling unless you're doing you know crazy overclock or something. Um, yeah. But you know it, it is clearly <laughs> it is clearly not as good as a larger cooler. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's a decent compared price. to a it's factory 40, cooler. It's going to be yeah. much much quieter and work just yes. as well as a factory cooler or a standard cooler. Y- yes, there's a chance that like one of the newer Wraith coolers might give you some better cooling at the cost of maybe, you know, a little bit noisier and obviously a higher profile. Um, but, I mean, 40 bucks, right? So yeah. There's some larger Noctua fans. Just the fan with no heatsink <laughs> costs like 20 bucks. So, 
you know, 40 bucks, you're getting a whole heat sink. And the, the way that this mounts is interesting. I don't know if the previous generation did this, but there's not all the cumbersome like bracketry and you put the bracket below the motherboard and you screw it with the standoffs to the top of the motherboard. And then you attach the, you have to take the fan off of the heat sink and, you know, so you can get clearance to the other screws that attach the heat sink assembly and like to the brackets and all the other stuff. This guy just has four screws and it's a backwards installation. The screws actually come in through the through the back of the motherboard. So you basically, you know, presumably you're doing a mini ITX system where it's not even a big deal to take the CPU and flip it on the desk on its face and just kind of lay, like lay your motherboard with CPU installed upside down onto it, just kind of like line the holes up. But you mm -hmm. put the, the, you screw the back plate into the back of your motherboard and those screws go into the bracket of this heatsink. So there's nothing on the top for you to have to mess with to try to, you know, attach or, or whatnot, uh, which I think is cool. It's a, a pain in the butt if you're trying to later change out your CPU without removing your motherboard. Obviously, that's, that's, an, that's something you can't do. Um, but, you know, for most people, it's not going to be an issue. Uh, and again, if it's a mini ITX system, typically you can get that motherboard out of, of you know, like a home theater PC style case uh, pretty easily if you, in, the, in the rare occasion that you did need to, to get in there. But that's kind of the price you pay for having something this much of a low profile, right? Because there's just there's simply no room right. for you to do anything and, and get any kind of mounting from above. That's uh, okay. And, yeah, or, I mean, you know, I'd, be, I'd be perfectly fine to making that sacrifice for something. I don't swap you know, coolers that often. <laughs> yeah, there's that. I mean, look at that. Even Maury had some higher profile RAM installed there, and it's it's like a centimeter or, or more shorter profile than the right. RAM. So, um, you know, you'd have to get low profile DRAM for the DRAM to, to not be your limit in a place where the, you know, where this, this, uh, heat sink and fan would have been a limit. Or even if you had some extra clearance, just giving yourself that much more room above the fan in a case that might not have vent holes right above where the CPU cooler is, uh, you know, it just gives you an extra opportunity for, to get extra air to be able to move, um, in there. Which is again yeah. another benefit, right? Right, no doubt. Crucial, uh, really, 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 really interesting write-up up on uh, the check report. They took a look at the new. Uh, well, I guess we we'll say the Crucial's MX300 SSD arrived with 3D NAND. Um, the newest drives in the series are running the 64-layer 3D TLC. And they took a look at the performance numbers. First of all, these are incredibly cheap. You're talking about a 500 gigabyte model selling for $130 US. And then what's crazy, and when I say crazy, I mean awesome. Um, the one terabyte drive, uh, the one terabyte drive is actually outperforming some more expensive Samsung drives in their test. These are not uh, as stringent a testing sequence as you might see uh, Mr. Malventana doing himself. But in terms of covering <laughs> the bases. Um, I thought it was kind of impressive to take a look at the performance numbers and to see uh, how well it was doing compared to uh, some more expensive drives, depending on the test. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah. this is this is yeah. good. These are cheap reviewed, and they are um, fast. We reviewed the all, only the one terabyte model of this drive. Uh, mm -hmm. We we actually reviewed it back in December. Um, we we're fortunate enough to to get kind of an early jump on them, but. Uh, yeah, they're definitely making more of the rounds, and it's a very solid, you know, good budget priced SSD, good performance. Um, yeah, I mean, so 500 gig model now going for 130 bucks. Back when we did the, our review of it, uh, it was priced at 140. So you're knocking another 10 bucks off since it launched just a couple months right. ago. Um, that's good to see. And again, uh, these are the SSDs that you usually would want to watch, just going by their track record. The MX pretty much MX anything from Crucial. Those are the ones that you'll tend to see come across on like these crazy sales right. every so often as well. Um, so an MX500 is the most recent in that line. Uh, so definitely something to just kind of keep your eye out on or uh, put it in yeah. put it in any of those price search engine things that will alert you to a lo price lower than whatever, you know, like it's, it's something handy to have there because don't be surprised to see like a one or a two terabyte model going mm -hmm. for, you know, just in the low twenties in cents yeah. per gig, or maybe even the high tens. Um, I mean, we're talking about right now, today, a crucial MX 500 one terabyte is selling for $250. And yeah. if you want a two terabyte version, 
um, which, you know, my little video editing wheels are going in my brain. You're looking at $500 for a two terabyte drive. Obviously, considerably more expensive than traditional rotating media, but that's cheap for a two yeah. terabyte SSD. Yeah, 20, 25 so. cents a gig. You really can't, um, you know, that's that's hard to beat these days, even for a SATA part. Um, that way, way cheaper than uh, Samsung parts, like anything mm -hmm. like an eight, 850 Evo or an 860 Evo. Um, and again, decent performance. Sure, it's not gonna it's not gonna beat uh, 850 or an 860, but it's gonna be close enough to justify the price being, you know, the the kind <laughs> of deal you're getting there. Yep. Such a deal it is. A friend of mine, though, I was talking to earlier today, said you do realize the only story worth talking about today is the new Intel Nooks. Uh, he's already pre-ordered one. Um, first review, actually, I've seen the, of the Intel Hades Canyon Nook is up on Tech Radar, And uh, this is essentially um, a Nook with discrete graphics. Uh, this is the Super Nook they kind of announced back at CES using the Intel uh, AMD Ryzen graphics processors. Um, this is pretty, I should say, the Radeon RX Vega graphics. You know, it's it's um, it's cool, and uh, yeah, you know, uh, we, um, I don't know how I actually, feel about the skull graphic on the front, but and it's it's not you know it's a lot less it's, expensive. It's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. It's like um. It's like backlit, and you can change. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually like RGB controllable, right? I think. Um, and uh, we actually had uh, Ken did the review of this for us. Um, we oh. actually have one. Our, yeah, we have a review of this up today as well. Um, I did not see it, was, it when I was scrolling through the stories this afternoon or this morning. No, we so. we have one up, and uh, he reviewed it to the thing that uh, at CES that they kept comparing it to, or at least saying uh -huh. that the performance was going to be uh, similar to, and that was um, comparing it to like a 1050 Ti. Right. Right. Um, which uh, we were kind of disappointed to see a lot of the other review sites didn't make that comparison. Um, because, you know, it's kind of like one of the well, things you want to see it compared to how okay so um, how did it fare uh it actually did pretty well um i mean i'm looking for this uh for this thing right part of the review to cite here but um yeah basically it ended up um about uh 10 percent faster than a 1050 ti nice. in the system and this is in a very small form factor thing Right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we were impressed overall. It ran reasonably quiet. Um, you know, it's just, it's not the standard four inch by four inch kind of square that you're used to for an Intel Nook. Uh, Intel right. has kind of been toying around with this other form factor for a while now. They did, uh, you know, this is the second, I, I believe, the second version of a, of a Nook that, you know, is this kind of a wider uh, form factor that is more like a NVIDIA Shield style. Mm -hmm. um, you know, size of a box, right? Um, yeah, but did good. I mean, if you want something that you can legit, you know, game on to some degree. Um, mm -hmm. Well, 1080p gaming you know, is going to be fine. Intel yeah. is pretty adamant that it's like, you know, the lightest, smallest VR ready. I would say most VR applications are going to be gasping a little bit per breath on on this processor. Yeah, but, you might uh, be kind of pushing it for for ninety frame per second VR stuff on this, yeah. depending on, on which the, game yeah. you're trying to do. Yeah, uh, that's um, that's with the Radeon RX Vega MGH graphics, right? Um, Three point one gigahertz yes. Intel Core i seven eighty eight o nine G, which is pretty nice. Um, did it come pre configured with sixteen gigs of Kingston HyperX, or do you guys have to build that into there? Uh, it, this sample came to us just with everything installed, but uh, I think that their their plan is for it to be like a bare bones where you know you okay. add what you want. Um, it's about a thousand dollars before you load the memory and the SSD into it. I think so. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see here. So total configuration as we tested was seventeen hundred bucks. Um, and that is you know with you having to get those other parts and. And adding them after, unless unless some vendor decides to just toss them in and sure. ship it that way. Um, but still, decent system. And for something like this, it's it's that you want that much power in something super tiny. So right. there's there's your price premium right there, right? You're, you know, because you, you could build something 
with equal or better power than this for way cheaper if you're willing to deal with a big hunk and desktop case sure. next to you. Um, yeah, but this is, you know, decent system. If you need something tiny and you're, you know, you're really cramped for space um, or you just want that elegant kind of install thing is where you can just have, you know, you're one of those people with the super postmodern style desk set up and at your house, <laughs> clear glass table, and you want everything, you know, that's in, in view. Uh, you, you need to sit this next to your trash can Mac Pro, right? You know, um, actually, this might be faster. <laughs> would, um, yeah. Certainly, uh, certainly not as irritating to expand. Uh, decent access set of ports on it, too, which is always a plus. The... Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, I'm torn between being delighted uh, by the fact that it's got that much graphical power on board and wanting a gaming machine with even more graphical power, although simply buying a GPU is still problematic. Although I recently saw a sort of sub-825 millimeter 1060 on sale for like $538, and I was like, oh! And then I remember that that's... Uh, you <laughs> that's know, like... It's like two hundred dollars over MSRP. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. it seems so affordable. And then I remembered what the actual MSRP was, and I got a lot less excited because I'm I'm looking for a GPU to put into this tiny machine that I'm building, and I was yeah. like, I should like no, that's a lot of money. <laughs> don't don't do it. Don't do it. They are coming down slowly because the mining thing is starting to not be as insane as it has been for the past several months. So um, yeah. you know, we're kind of hoping that the but unfortunately. What I mean by prices coming down to MSRP is people selling their used uh, GPUs, right. um, you know. But they are getting there. Uh, they're kind of trickling down very, very slowly. Anybody yeah, selling people... a very short used GPU? Let me know. Um, and that uh, what I actually think of as Intel's Super Nook uh, is uh, you can pre-order it now. And deliveries uh, should be happening in the next couple of weeks on that one. What's going on with? Uh, so Denali reference architecture for NVMe SSDs. Um, it pulls software functionality out of the SSD, kind of gives that responsibility to something higher up in the hardware stack. Um, address mapping, yeah. garbage collection, where leveling. Um, or, I mean, the, the, the kind of the register said uh, the Denali project is a spec, right? Um, so the, the idea here is the SSD controllers to commoditize the data center NVMe SSD world. Right. What they're going for is get as close as you possibly can to just a very dumb thing that connects the flash to the host. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, let let the window, let everything on the OS side handle as much as possible. Let it handle all the wear leveling. Let it handle all the garbage collection. All that stuff. Um, you can. You can get much better performance, especially if you know exactly what your workload is and you want to be able to sure. optimize things. Compared to what goes on now is the SSD maker has to try to guess what a person's going to be doing with this SSD. And that's why you'll see things like enterprise SSDs behaving poorly for consumer workloads and vice versa, right? If you hit a consumer work SSD with hit one of those MX500 SSDs with a crazy SQL server enterprise workload, it's probably not going to do that great. Um, you know, and vice versa, right? Uh, in this case, if you could make the controller and the firmware extremely simplistic on the SSD and basically just make it a dumb pipe so that the system can speak directly to the flash uh, without any of that extra overhead or other stuff that the SSD would normally have to do on its end, and if you're willing to let the, the storage stack in the OS deal with that stuff... Um, you know, you could potentially make much cheaper SSDs, first of all, uh, so that you can hook a whole bunch of flash up to a system more economically. And on the flip side of that, um, you know, just have, get better optimization on the OS side based on what the workload you're trying to do. So whenever you hear SSDs having different amounts of over-provisioning or different amounts of, mm -hmm. you know, different configurations or whatever, all that stuff can be done with just software switches on the OS side. It can just figure out, okay, I want 7% over-provisioning for this particular array of flash. And it just does it. You know, it'll just keep an extra 7% available and, and not allocate that. Um, you know, it's an interesting concept. Uh, it's, uh, Microsoft definitely has some 
tweaks that they will need to do, not just Denali, but they're going to need to do something with the NVMe or just the storage stack in general in sure. Windows, specifically because of um, the whole meltdown inspector thing, right? right. Uh, the biggest, the biggest uh, performance hit people see due to the meltdown inspector patches is the storage performance because of the fact that you're hopping between user and kernel space. Um, so they're probably, they're kind of already on the hook to try to do some, you know, do something different there and make things work better. Um, so good to see something like this as well being pushed, even though this is going to be much more of a server thing at first. Uh, you know, you never know this, this might, you might see this uh, trickle down into more consumer things in general. Um, there's already parts of the NVMe 1.3 spec that allows the host to control some of the additional functions of that the SSD controller would normally do, or even vice versa. Sometimes the there are, there are means I forget the exact name, but there are means for like the SSD controller to actually borrow some DRAM from the host via nice. the NVMe driver, and it can actually give it some buffer space. Uh, insignificant compared to the amount of uh, DRAM in your system. We're only talking like you know megabytes worth of worth of space, but. Right, uh, def but enough to where you can make an SSD cheaper because you don't have to put DRAM on the SSD if it can borrow some memory from the host and just you know cache some things that way. Um, yeah, you know, just progress basically on SSD stuff, right? Um, right. Yeah, uh, but again, this this Denali thing in in this uh, you know in this current state is different is totally a server thing interesting interesting yep hmm g skill overclocks dual channel trident z rgb memory up to five thousand megahertz on air cooling um pardon the pause before that but every time i read this i just think it's even more ridiculous to realize how fast it is this is the uh Trident Z RGB memory kit that was, you know, they're claiming like 4,700 megahertz speeds uh, using Samsung's BDI memory. Um, they actually, uh, as you say, they sort of, you know, they've gotten it to 5,000 megahertz uh, on air cooling, i.e. without adding liquid cooling. And apparently it's going to show up soon as a retail project or a retail product. Um 5,007.4 megahertz uh, on an MSI Gaming Pro Carbon AC and an Intel Core i7-8700K. Um, if you want to get nerdly, the article's worth reading. Uh, 2126, 2646, 2T timing. And quote, while they did the and quote, while they did not mention the voltage, the kit likely required about 1.5 volts since the base 4,700 megahertz kit needs 1.45 volts. Uh, volts. 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 Yeah. Vol <laughs> Vaults, volts, aardvarks, it's all the same thing. Um, You're definitely pushing it. Yeah, and this is dual channel, not single channel, so that's uh, that's a big deal. Um, G-Skill says they're not quite ready to bring it to market, um, but, uh, quote, they are getting closer, and hopefully by the time they do, membrane pricing will have settled down a bit. So, yeah, it's funny, because my 1800X... Uh, Memory was problematic for overclocking, and I'm I'm actually about to update the memory on that and go back to overclocking it for fun and joy. But uh, I mean, do you overclock the memory in any of your systems, or is that a little more esoteric than you want to get into, Alan? The furthest I usually get is just whatever the built-in XMP profile for that memory is, sure. Um, which typically will bring it to just the as advertised speed, really. Okay. Um, you know, because a lot of memory, you'll get something like, uh, you know, DDR3200 rated memory you put in a system and it'll actually be doing something like 2400 unless you have to, mm -hmm. you have to go into the BIOS and specifically say use XMP profile one or, right. or whatever, um, which will typically, you know, result in a bump in voltage as well, because that's part of the it's part of the profile. Usually it's like, hey, I need this voltage to run at this speed. Um, that's as far as I typically go with it. And then right. everything else I want to. Everything else I want to squeeze out of the system will just usually just be CPU and GPU overclocks. Um, it, even to the point of if the multiplier works in such a way where I have to go a little bit under on the on the DRAM speed, I'll just I'll do that, um, mm -hmm. and you know, in order just to get the squeeze a little bit more out of the CPU, just a little more. Yep. If you're on a if you're on AMD Ryzen systems and 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 stuff like that, uh, you actually want to go the other way. You want to try to more aggressively overclock the memory bus speed 
uh, mm-hmm. because that's that's tied to your um, infinity fabric speed on those systems. Right. Um, so it <laughs> makes more sense for you to even like relax the timings, go do the opposite of like the XMP profile, but you're just trying to get more speed, more raw speed out of the like straight line speed out of the bus. Hmm. Um, that's not yeah. complicated. <laughs> uh, that's that's the thing we've we've dabbled we've dabbled with it it is a pretty big headache um to get right uh once you get it right and it's stable it's great uh it's just you know you, you have to you have to tinker to an additional degree to squeeze that extra performance out of that platform but performance is definitely there for the taking you just gotta know what you're doing and there you have it ladies and gentlemen Anything you can talk about coming up at PC Per, or is everything pretty much under the NDA right now? I got a couple of nice NDA things that are probably going to be good stuff, but I can't say what the heck they are. And uh, you know, <laughs> I think I think both of them. Let's see, I think both of them are coming up next week. Uh, yeah, no. both of them are next week. So there'll be some good storage stuff uh, next week, and I've got. A uh, couple like just catch up pieces I've been working on. There's like a 16 SSD dock thing, hot swap dock that I've got um, that I need to post on. And uh, I've been doing some crazy raid testing with mm-hmm. uh, VROC and with uh, SATA raid guards. Mm-hmm. Um, but that kind of stuff takes for forever. And uh, I've had to rework my, my how my test works like four times over for that so far to get it right. Well, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, it's just, you know, run run uh, 56 hours worth of tests on something, and then oh, oh, I need to I need to change how the tool works so that these numbers are are actually correct. Darn, that's not and emotionally then, traumatizing. And, no, 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 not at all. And then queue another you know 56 hour test run, and then and then find something else that's wrong, and then do it again. You know, it's just like it's just several days <laughs> that just get blown every time. No big deal. No big deal. Yeah, I remember having that conversation with somebody. They're like, how long is this going to take? I'm like, well, every time we run the series of benchmarks, it's nine hours. And they were like, what? And I'm like, and every time we change the parameter, we have to start the benchmarks over again. They were like, how many? I'm like, I've got six days into this already. They're yeah. like, that is the cover story, and it's going to take what it takes. Yeah. Uh, what makes it worse is when you're trying to do tests of like different variations of RAID and different numbers of drives <laughs> in the RAID. And then... Uh-huh. Yeah. So even if you make the test really quick, you're adding multiple dimensions to the things that you're repeating the test across. And yeah. if you don't know for sure if it worked and scaled properly as it should have until you have all the numbers and you can look at it after the fact. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just a headache. Yeah. Hey, uh, one last thought on GPUs before we skedaddle. Um, Asus, uh, excuse me, not Asus, uh, AMD Radeon uh, RX 580s uh, have been showing up for sale. That supply seems to have finally been released again. There are some interesting prices um, on GTX 1060s, but those are going to be the, the sub $300 one of those is going to be a 3 gigabyte, not a 6 gigabyte card. And I, I don't know if you want uh, a 3 gigabyte card. So just double check that before you go. Um, yeah, the 3 gig, uh, actually, if you're okay with the 1063 gig, this is actually the time to be looking for them even on the resale market yeah. uh, because there's an awful lot of the mining operations are starting to yank all of those from their mm-hmm. racks to sell um, because we're, we're getting close to the point where uh, certain mining algorithms will not uh, have enough DRAM or VRAM yeah. on, on those particular boards. Um, it's, even, it's to the point now where it's so close that if you're on a Windows 10 machine... Windows 10 actually takes some more of the VRAM just mm-hmm. by default. Uh, right. So newer OSs are actually having a harder time with those algorithms, specifically on cards that have three gig right now. So it's actually a good time to get them. Um, yeah. Keep an uh, keep an eye if you are if you aren't buying them used, um, keep an eye on uh, keep an eye on Newegg because Newegg seems to have and a, Newegg with occasional gusts of Best Buy seem to be the best place to be shopping for GPUs right now. So, yep. and I gotta say, props to AMD for getting those uh, those uh, RX Vega cards out. Finally, yep. now I just need a incredibly short GPU. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> oh man, nothing says challenging like trying to find a GPU. At least this week. With that, ladies and gentlemen. 
Thank you so much for listening to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. You can find more episodes, information on how to subscribe, and all the good stuff over at twit.tv slash twitch. You can find Ryan Shrout, my regular co-host, and of course, Mr. Alan Malventano, today's guest co-host over at PC Perspective. That's pcper.com. I'm Patrick Norton, if you didn't know. Pleasure to meet you. You can find me at my regular weekly gig at techthing.com. And let me tell you something. We talked a lot about Netflix 4K this week. Actually, that was last week. This week, there's a whole new show with entirely new subjects, including uh, some discussions of what the best 4K gaming TVs are out there. And we found some fantastic information uh, on uh, on uh, some of the performance, uh, gaming performance on TVs. There's links to that in the show notes at techthing.com. Thank you for listening. And uh, remember, ladies and gentlemen, We'll be back next week with all new news and probably more whining about GPU costs. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Alan Malventano. We'll catch you next week on Twitch.